This conference will now be recorded. Okay. All right, folks. So very good. So we are in chapter 15. We're looking at the endocrine system. Let's, uh, you know, before I start doing this, let's, you know, I do want to, let me just share something with you all. Let's look at this. So everybody in class here and those that are online, you can look on where I've showed. So take a look at this sheet right here. This sheet right here says endocrine pathologies, endocrine disorders, same thing, disorders, pathologies. These are diseases that affect the endocrine system, okay? So for our lab today, in addition to we're going to be here in, in, on campus here, we're going to be looking at uh, the bones and the articulated skeleton. I'm going to go over one table at a time with you all as far as all the bones for the uh, lab quiz. Um, those online, you'll, I'll, I'll discuss with you in a moment there, but you'll see here those online, this endocrine disorder sheet. So this is a lab that I would like you to do before um, beginning today. And I want you to be able to, and it's in, it's in coursework. Uh, from 1.30 on today, um, you're going to take this two-sided sheet and you're going to either copy it as far as, not with a copier, but with like, you're going to print it out or you're going to write it out, okay? Type it out or, or write it out, but you're going to copy all of these different pathologies. It's just one way to help you just to uh, understand a little bit more regarding what each of these pathologies, each of these disorders represents. So that's part of the lab for today. Next week, um, both of you, so those on, online will do a virtual dissection. Those here in class will actually, will have a few uh, brains, sheep brains, and we're going to actually uh, do them here in class and dissect them here. So that's why I'm just giving you the dissection sheet for the sheep brain uh, early on, but you'll have it for next Tuesday, we'll do it, okay? How's it going? Hey, you just, there you go, thank you. Okay, no worries. Thank you for letting me know. No, I didn't yeah. want to just walk out. Yeah, no, no, it's all okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. So, all right, folks. So, um, yeah, so you've got that. So, so the endocrine disorders, that's what you're going to be looking at today because we're in that chapter and you're going to have that quiz next week. So this is why I want to have you work on that this week. And that's why we'll, we'll do the brain uh, next week. Okay. So just to share even with those online and um, you'll see it in coursework in unit two. Uh, but I'll talk to those in class about it today and those online, I'll talk to you at the end of the lecture today. All right, so let's look at, uh, we're at the adrenal medulla. So do you recall that I said to you that the adrenal gland has a cortex, has an outer portion, and then has an inner portion, that medullary layer. And that really, when we talk about different organs in the human body, there can be a cort cortical layer, cortical, meaning an outer portion, and a medullary region, an inner portion, okay? So when we're looking at the adrenal gland, now we're focusing on that medullary area where it's more of nervous tissue, so from like the nervous system. So these will actually create, produce, secrete <coughs> neurotransmitters, these epinephrine, norepinephrine, these nerve chemicals, also known as adrenaline, noradrenaline, right? Very important. Um, so they are, we call them, so write this term down. We'll use the term neurohormone. So these are very unique in comparison to the other nerve chemicals that we talked about as far as, um, as far as uh, acetam uh, <laughs> serotonin, dopamine, right? Um, we, we discussed them, um, I'm blanking on. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Acetylcholine, which is a very important and major one of the, the uh, neurotransmitters and such. Thanks, Ben. So uh, very important. Now, look at what you'll see here as far as, so they help to regulate blood circulation and carbohydrate use when the body is stressed or excited. Because remember that when the body is under sympathetic stimulation, under st sympathetic stimulation, prepares the body for action. Right? So we're really, we're revved up, we're ready to go. Are we going to fight? Are we going to run? Are we going to, you know, we're, we're, and again, too, this is not so much the case where, all right, hey, yeah, we're always going to fight, we're always going to run, but how about we're going to a job interview and we're stressed out and did we start getting that sympathetic response. Um, we get the, 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 the dry mouth. 
sweaty palms, right? Those are all sympathetic responses, okay? So epinephrine, norepinephrine, they are very important as far as that sympathetic response. And they really are, think about it for a moment. It's like a very important special chemical that can give you kind of superpowers for a very short period of time. Do you know that also when, when you've got this circulating through your body that you can actually see a little bit better? Because what will happen is that under sympathetic stimulation, your pupils will, what do you think? Do you think your pupils will dilate, get bigger, or get narrow? They get bigger. They get bigger so that they can take in more light so that you can see what's going on around you, okay? So very important. So not used as neurotransmitters elsewhere in the body, but they are in, in other areas. And so that adrenal medulla, very important. And here you're seeing on this next slide, showing you how the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, in particular the anterior portion, the front area, the anterior portion of the pituitary gland, release their hormones in order for then the adrenal cortex to release its hormones. Remember we talked about in the cortex, the hormone, the stress hormone, cortisol, right? Do you remember I said that cortisol, cortisol will help as far as providing an, enough glucose for the tissues of the body because you need that when you, when you have to have some energy in order to do work and in order to be prepare the body for action. But how about if we have too much of this cortisol that's being released when we're under stress on a regular basis, right? Chronic basis, not, a, not such a good thing, right? So as a result, are you more prone to gain weight when you have too much stress going on? Yes, because of cortisol. Are you prone to be sick more often? You are, because it's an anti-inflammatory. So it's actually decreasing the inflammatory response, which is suppressing your immune response. So when you're stressed out, are you prone to get sick? Can you get sick more easy, easier? Yes, go ahead. So with like a cortisol shot, like- Cortisone shot, cortisone. Like yes. So it's localized. So a cortisone shot in a joint of your body, that's a localized event that's taking place. So it's not affecting so much overall body and such. So yeah, can it like increase blood glucose levels a little bit? Yeah, it can. But you know, on the whole, and diabetics gotta have to be careful with this, but on the whole, it's more of a localized situation occurring, yeah. And, and trying to really, and really I'll tell you, if you have an, a joint in your body that's inflamed and in, in much discomfort, pain and discomfort, taking a cortisone shot can really make a difference. Does it help everybody? No, it doesn't help everybody. But can it help you? I, I've experienced it myself and it's really uh, quite remarkable. Anybody else have a cortisone shot? Ever have one done uh, for pain? Did it help you? Yeah, understood. I mean, and it can have, so know this, that even more, it can have more of a lingering effect. So mine lasted like six to eight months around that range there. Um, and it was really helping my knee. So, you know, you don't know, you don't know. But everybody's different in how they process it also and depending upon the injury. So let's move on. All right, so this is an interesting slide. It says phthalates, phthalates, right? So they are endocrine disruptors. So if it's an endocrine disruptor, it's affecting the endocrine system somehow, affecting the, the hormones that your body is secreting somehow. So interferes with normal hormone synthesis or function. So whether the uh, function, the action of the hormone at the target cells of the tissues, right? Or actual the production of the hormone, right? And so, these phthalates are used in manufacture of consumer products like lotions, soaps, shampoos, and plastic containers. Have you ever um, seen like water bottles or yes, your your like those kind of water bottles or like disposable water bottles or regular like that you would buy and reuse and such that will say that they don't have these types of chemicals present within. Um, and it's important because this can over time leach into the water that you're drinking and you take this stuff in. So you'll see here, health risk to children. So pediatricians advise to purchase only phthalate-free products, right? And so what's wh why are they used anyway, right? Well, one is to just ruin our health. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> but but think about it though for a moment that this is this this can 
be the case. This can absolutely occur that it can mess people up. And some people, again, are more susceptible to it than others, right? So use the soften poly so PVC plastic as solvents in cosmetics and other consumer products. And look at what it can do. Not only, right, it's an endocrine disruptor, can affect the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, the reproductive system. And honestly, think about it as far as the liver and kidneys are concerned, your liver is, is uh, really tip processing any type of toxic chemicals and such. Also your, your uh, kidneys, removal of waste and such. So very, very, um, your liver and kidneys can work and do great things for you for many years. But once they start to be, uh, to, to give you a problem and, and start to uh, say, okay, enough is enough, so to speak, as far as how much damage and insult the body has taken, that, that'll turn into major problems for you. I've known quite a few people over the years, patients and friends, that have had uh, liver issues that it's really a tough and difficult thing to deal with and, and needing a liver transplant. Um, look up one time, I'll, I'll have to show you, um, it's called ascites, ascites, A-S-C-I-T-E-S, and it's fluid buildup in the abdomen, and it looks, ridiculous like i'm telling you like look up front for a moment here right so like like the, the the abdomen can swell like three and four times the the amount filled with fluid yeah it's, it's some crazy stuff so let's move on so the pancreas pancreas is involved with uh, a few things here as far as hormonally it's involved in the processing and the ability for your body to utilize glucose it's a sugar, it's a monosaccharide. Simple sugar, very important for the function of and the nutrition for cells of the body, okay? It's also involved in producing different enzymes in order to allow for and really process and break down any type of products that your body is taking in as far as food is concerned. So enzymatic production as well as hormone production. So let's take a look here and see this slide here since we're talking about the endocrine system. We'll discuss this more when we look at the uh, digestive system. But you'll see here that different cells present within these little portions of the pancreas. Let's go here for a moment and just actually, I'm going to exit out for a moment here. And I want to show you an image of pancreatic islets. And I'll show you all. All right. So, folks, only these little areas here, those that are online that are looking at this, those are the islets. Everything else in the tissue is going to produce enzymes. So, let me show you all here in class. All right, folks, so you see these little areas that look kind of like a flower? That's the area in that tissue that's involved in right here, this little area here, these little flowers that you're seeing there on that on the pancreas. Those are the areas that are involved in hormone production, okay? So as we're looking at this here, let's see if I can make this bigger for you, those um, line here. Tiny. <laughs> All right, you see the blue areas here, folks? Those are the islets. Those are involved in the hormone production. All the other tissue is involved in enzymatic production as far as your uh, digestive system is concerned. All right, folks, so again, seeing these little blue areas here, 
those are the islets. Those are the specific areas for hormone production. And here you can see an actual image for a, a cell, a sample under the microscope. And this would be the islet area where you're producing the uh, specific hormones. And let's go back to the slide cell. And here, this is just showing you. So you all have heard of this term, insulin, right? You've heard of that term, insulin. So the beta cells are secreting this insulin, and it will lower blood glucose levels. So after you eat, your blood glucose levels are higher, right? After digestion and such, there's more glucose circulating in the blood, in the cardiovascular system. Well, the pancreas will kick out insulin in order to help to assimilate that glucose into the cells of the body, right? So that's how it lowers the blood glucose levels. Now, you'll see here the alpha cells are producing this glucagon. It actually will be involved with periods of time where you're not eating. This will be released in order to access the glucose that you've stored and break it down so that it can release glucose. So if you've ever felt um, like a hypoglycemic type episode where we all experience this sometime during the day, it's been a while since you've eaten and you kind of feel a little tired, a little, and you know that you're like, you need to eat. Well, your body will release glucagon, which will help to break down gly glycogen, which is stored in the liver. It's just the, a larger form of glucose, right? We call it polysaccharide and it helps to break it down. So it helps to release that glucose in the body. And then this here, the delta cells, secreting this growth hormone inhibiting hormone, right? And this is interesting, right? Because we talked about growth hormone, right? We talked about too much of it or not enough of it as far as for people that are gigantic proportions or those that have acromegaly, right? They've stopped growing, yet they still have more growth, growth hormone being kicked out if maybe it's a tumor. And so this is, and then if we have too little of it, those that are of dwarf proportions, right? They're small, very tiny, very short in height and such. So let's move on. And so here you're just seeing as far as what's going on and what the effects are of um, insulin and glucagon. And so they have opposite effects. Okay? They have opposite effects in what they're doing, trying to help to reduce the level of blood glucose, reduce the blue blood glucose levels, or increase the blood glucose levels. Okay. So now we have as far as so those that are online here, there we go. So just seeing as far as the action of um, insulin and glucagon and how they do act in opposite ways as far as their effect on the levels of blood uh, glucose levels. And then you're seeing here as far as the different disorders that can take place as a result of having issues with management of blood glucose levels and such. So here we go as far as uh, type 2 diabetes, right? Major risk factor is obesity. Not everybody that's overweight has diabetes, right? Type 2, but some do. You know, a good portion of our population, unfortunately, does. You'll see here that blood containing uh, too much sugar damages capillaries. This can lead to uh, tissues that can die. Uh, complications can develop terrible as far as these are situations where folks can end up having uh, parts of their body um, removed, right? As far as like, um, so as a result of damage to the tissue and gangrene not being properly uh, healed um, can lead to having amputations of toes, of the foot, lower extremity. This is not uncommon, folks. Um, and so this is really a major uh, complication that can occur. Um, having someone with that is pre-diabetic, right? The blood glucose levels are um, elevated, and there should be some type of intervention to try and address what's going on, lose weight, change your diet, do different things, exercise, in order to try and help with this. And here we have in this next slide, you're seeing here as far as hypoglycemia, and this is what I talked about before there. And so... Uh, can be as a result of a pathology or just normal everyday living as far as you haven't eaten for a while and so your blood glucose levels are low. And so then uh, glucagon would have to be released in order to help to raise blood glucose levels if you're not eating. 
Now, as far as your reproductive system, so we're going to, I'm really not going to go too far into it as far as for this chapter regarding this chart. So recall, I gave you this chart last time, right? And this just goes over the ovarian and uterine cycles, right? And so what's going on each month and what's going on with the different hormones and such. So I'll talk about that more at the end of the semester, but just know that estrogen, progesterone, yeah, have very important roles as far as also um, different other hormones also. And we'll discuss that in more detail, like I said, um, at the end of the, the semester here. But you'll see here that gonads. So gonads would be the testes, would be the ovaries, and they produce gametes. Gametes are the sex cells. So that's the egg and that's the sperm. Okay. And so you'll see here that there's also being produced hormones. So we have here estrogen, the feminizing hormone, testosterone, the masculinizing hormone, right? as well as progesterone from the ovaries also. Okay? And you'll see here that the pineal gland, pineal gland is a gland, take a look at this sagittal head, this half head here. And what you're going to see here is that right here at the fin my, my fingertip, very deep within the brain, that's the pineal gland. Right. So the pineal gland is right there. And so that pineal gland secretes melanin. No, melatonin. Right. It's easy to confuse them. So melanin, melanin is for what? It's for pigment. Right. So for skin pigmentation, hair pigmentation, melanin. Melatonin has an effect of really helping to calm the body so that it prepares you for sleep. So has anybody ever taken melatonin as far as a, as a supplement and such? Yeah, absolutely. It's very common and such. And so this can help kind of calm the body down and use as a sleep aid, all right? Um, so that's what's produced by the pineal gland. And really what happens is that your body naturally, and this is, I think, also a contributing factor to why when it changes outside, when we have these changes where we do the, um, not only just uh, the, the, the light and the dark as far as the days, but daylight savings can kind of mess us up a bit and such. And so we really, it takes us a few weeks to really get back in the swing of things when, because we're used to, when we see it getting darker outside, it starts to naturally calm our bodies and such. And our body will secrete this melatonin. So what happens when someone's blind? Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. So folks that are blind, they have major issues with going to sleep. Yeah, it's it's really because we we rely you you don't realize how much we rely upon the fact that when we get up in the morning and it's sunny out right now some days it's not going to be sunny out but still you're there's still the sun's going to be shining shining a bit even if it's cloudy it's still going to be lighter outside that's a trigger to help wake you up in the morning as it gets darker outside again the pineal gland produces this melatonin secretes it releases it and it helps to calm you down. Go on to the next slide. And so this slide, that's why I made copies of it for you. Um, it's, it doesn't look that clear, but uh, I just mentioned to you regarding that, like, so hormones the, that are produced, right? These hormones that are produced really can affect what goes on as far as the uh, production of a mature egg and mature sperm in order to allow for um, possible fertilization to take place and the reproduction of our species. Yeah. So, so vital and so very important and such. So depending upon what goes on with levels of these hormones, because the, the hormones will spike, they will peak, and as a result, different events will happen as a result of these hormones having different levels, whether they go up or whether they drop, things will happen and such. And so again, like I said, we'll, we'll go into more detail with that when we get into the reproductive chapters, okay? And here you're just seeing as far as an image of uh, the testes, the, these are the gonads. The gonads also for the female, the ovaries, about the size of an almond. So those of you online, there you go as far as the testes, the gonads producing the gametes, the sperm, the ovaries, the gonads producing the gametes, the egg. All right, you'll see here also, Skeletal muscle, newly discovered hormone, ericin, right, produced during and after exercise. Now, interesting here, 
targets white adipose cells, right? These adipose tissue fat to convert to brown adipose cells, which are which are involved in more of temperature regulation than just the the white the white quote, quote unquote yellow adipose tissue, primarily for insulation, okay? Heat producing those brown adipose cells. And understand that when you're exercising, right? When you're exercising, what happens to your core body temperature? It goes up, does it not? And so as a result, we need to do all that we can to cool ourselves down over time, right? So we're gonna sweat. We're also gonna become flushed because the, the blood vessels are gonna um, dilate and you're gonna look red because we're trying to release the heat from your muscles doing their work. You'll see here the thymus gland. The thymus gland we'll talk about when we're talking about and discussing the uh, lymphatic system and your immune function and such, okay? So they're really important in uh, thymosin involving in maturing T lymphocytes. These are specific types of white blood cells that are very important for your specific immune function in the body. Those that have AIDS and are then can advance into HIV, have HIV and can advance into AIDS, they have issues with their T cells and such. And so those T cells get infected with viruses, they get hijacked, and it's not a good thing. And we'll talk more about that when we look at um, the lymphatic and uh, the immune system. Your heart. So you'll see here the heart produces this ANP. ANP, atrionitritic uh, peptide, will help to decrease blood pressure. But for those that have like chronic high blood pressure, it's not strong enough to, to really keep it at a lower level, okay? Um, and so what it does is it acts to inhibit, inhibit reabsorption of sodium ions and water in the kidneys. And so as a result, if it inhibits this, it's going to decrease the volume of blood within your body, and that will help to decrease your blood pressure. The GI tract, you'll see here the GI tract, so your gastrointestinal tract, your digestive tract, produces several hormones that influence your appetite and help you to feel that you're full, that you're sated, okay? And so that's very important. And also have roles in digestion. We talked a little bit about regarding the, the pancreas and such. And you'll see here, as far as I think this is the yeah last slide. So you see here that endocrine system produces hormones. When you think of the endocrine system, think of it like another system that works with the nervous system to help to control the functions of the body and to maintain homeostasis. So the nervous system, very fast, right? Fast acting, short, you know, doesn't last very long. But how about the endocrine system? The endocrine system, short, as far as it's acting, it kind of takes a while to act, but it has a lasting effect over a longer period of time. All right, folks, very good. Very good. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording here right now.